uh, emphasizing very strongly the need for trade and, and, and open trade. Uh, and of course, we Indonesians within this uh, environment of ASEAN. And 2015 is the time that uh, we normally need to have the economic integration of ASEAN. How do you look at it? How important is ASEAN from your perspective in Indonesia? Uh, and how optimistic are you about the uh, uh, success of ASEAN in two, by the end of 2015? I think ASEAN has, is, and will continue to be important for a country like Indonesia. I mean, I spent a good part of my own uh, research on ASEAN. And if you talk about ASEAN economic community, it's not like, okay, at the end of this year, uh, a door will open up and then you're gonna have this flood of goods coming in. It's, not, it's, it's been a process that's been ongoing actually since 1991 with the ASEAN free trade area. So by and large, 99% of goods between six, the six uh, major ASEAN countries and probably about 95% or eight, 90 to 95% of goods with the, with the 10 and uh, 90 to 95% with Japan, Korea, China, uh, Australia, and New Zealand is already zero, zero tariff. Yes. I left out one country, which is India. Mm. Uh, India is the, is the least uh, opened up one. You know, 80% only is uh, at zero percent. So by an, you're actually already trading at, at zero tariff. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So actually, uh, the misconception is actually the benefits for ASEAN is going to come from the global value chain that, that, that is already happening. It will come hopefully from trade in services and movement of professionals. Mm -hmm. And uh, there, there were some numbers uh, that were just recently um, from a study uh, that 14 million jobs will be created by 2025 if ASEAN economic community comes about. And 41% uh, will be high skill employment. Yeah? And out of that, half of them would be in Indonesia. So that, that's kind of a good number uh, to have. And trade in services is going to be the next uh, benefit. Uh, for for uh, the countries, so it will happen uh, as a process. It will continue to happen. Uh, it's not that something at the end of 2015 something will happen uh, because it's already happening. And I think market forces will will end up uh, making sure that the ASEAN Economic Community and the the RCEP. You know, for those of you who are not trade people, RCEP stands for Regional Com East Asia Regional Comprehensive economic partnership. So it's, it's the, that 10 plus 6. Yep. Uh, and this is already happening, whereas TPP is still being negotiated. Yep. I'll open up for questions from the floor. Uh, a quick question. Because I know you and you know, I know your questions that can be long. So <laughs> A very short one. A thank short you, one. Prof. Uh, my name is Ais. I'm just a lay person. Uh, Prof. Uh, Murray, thank you very much for coming. And thank you very much for your micro and macro uh, perspective, global perspective, and that put me in a, in, in a box to ask you two simple questions. Number one, uh, my profound regret when you lost to Lemmy on the WTO, and I think that the world lost you, and the loss of great profound credibility that you can contribute, what would you say that the missing point that they are still not doing and the WTO need to, do, to be doing now? Secondly, with regard to the domestic uh, perspective, um, it seems to be that uh, the president is doing housekeeping. Good housekeeping is the priority. But the question you notice, the inconsistency in Indonesia is the biggest problem. You find that, for example, even in your portfolio, uh, creative economy seems to be not in the picture. And you notice that not only I am surprised, but uh, John Hawking too is <laughs> greatly surprised because that is not in the configuration. How do you assure yourself that Indonesia would be very pragmatic in terms of policy making, in, in terms of the challenges ahead, which is very, very dramatic? Thank you very much. Thank you. So two questions. Uh, on, on what's miss, probably what's missing or what, can, what more can be done by the WTO, I think you know, what was started already, this whole uh, idea about global value chain and trade in tasks, uh, a better understanding of that and uh, uh, therefore being able to move on other parts of the agenda uh, is probably what's missing. And I, I'm a great believer in evidence-based um, policy making. Mm -hmm. uh, 
so the more evidence uh, we have about the benefits uh, that you know, more opening up uh, gives, the better it is. But it's got to be concrete. I mean, the, the big battle for trade uh, people, including trade ministers, trade ministers is always a very, very tough job because you have to convince uh, the wider public that this is going to benefit you. Yeah. And it, you know, the trade theory will tell you, or trade uh, numbers will t tell you that it benefits the whole country as a whole. It benefits the whole world as a whole. But in each country, there will be groups or sectors which lose. And unless you can compensate those or, or re, uh, restructure them or reform them to another sector, you are, you are that, that silent, uh, the, 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 the beneficiaries are silent and the little uh, sector that's uh, losing is very loud, yeah. uh, as we know politically. So uh, this is a challenge, but the more you can uh, help countries deal with it, otherwise you're gonna end up with this continued mercantilistic reciprocal negotiations, which is where the impasse uh, we are at. Uh, the second question was, why did creative economy uh, disappear uh, in, the, in, in the government structure? It didn't disappear, they just, um, they just uh, uh, chose the new head of the uh, Creative Economy Agency. Okay, so uh, I believe that the new government does prioritize creative economy because I personally think after working on it for uh, a number of years in Indonesia, it's, it's another uh, huge opportunity for Indonesia in, the, in going beyond the new normal. Yeah. And it's high value added uh, and it is very employment generation. It, it will uh, help a lot of SMEs and micro enterprises and it, it can be uh, widespread. And Indonesia has the comparative advantage because we have the uh, cultural resources yep. and that mobile interconnectivity is actually part uh, of the way why I think creative economy is gonna really uh, take off. So uh, the government has a new creative agency and I believe that there's enough hype and enough momentum now that whatever the government does, these, these uh, creative industries that are already there are, are, will still take off. Yeah. Uh, please, uh, if you can go to the mic or take the microphone. Setia di Wijaya, Indonesian Business Center. Uh, Professor Pangestu, I saw you during the Indonesian diaspora uh, in Jakarta in August, and you spoke about the importance of diaspora, Indonesian outside Indonesia that can contribute uh, in terms of trade, economy of Indonesia. How much progress have we got since then? Has there been any certain movement that continue to progress? Thank you. Uh, I think in diaspora is a very important uh, group. A lot of countries, like you look at India, they use their diaspora very effectively to uh, create Bangalore and a lot of them also in, uh, in Silicon Valley having links to India. So actually, we, we are uh, looking at that uh, very carefully. Uh, the diaspora movement in the U.S., for instance, uh, uh, some of them are based in Silicon Valley. Uh, they are also making links back uh, to Indonesia. Uh, in film, we're also seeing it. Uh, and uh, what, what I think is, is, uh, is going to be continued by the foreign ministry as well as other ministries is to, to have a, a better database and networking with the diaspora uh, in, in many parts uh, of the world. Uh, I think Singapore, Malaysia must be quite strong. Uh, the US is, is also quite strong and uh, Europe, yeah, Europe and Australia. So they can be the, if you like, uh, the, the window to doing business uh, and trade, opening up trade and investment uh, in any country. Yeah, I have a question over there. Um, I do think you will have to have a microphone. Hi, uh, I'm Adi from RSIS. Uh, Ibu, what do you think about Jokowi's plan to maximize uh, National Development Planning Board or BAPANAS role? Uh, will, it, will it undermine Indonesia's economic sustainability? Thank you. What was to Can revive you, or to revitalize? Uh, 
what do you think about uh, Jokowi's plan to maximize Bapenas role? Yeah, Bapenas is the planning agency, mm. and uh, I believe the planning agency, the planning agency's job uh, should be it's, it's, it should be the think tank and the strategic planner uh, for the country. So uh, I hope that what what will happen uh, is more uh, more of a uh, of an overall planning rather than. Uh, maybe in the past it became too much like sectoral planning uh, and then you will find that each ministry or each sector can have inconsistent uh, planning as well as targets which are uh, uh, going to be cr uh, overlapping or uh, be inconsistent with each other. I can give you an example. For instance, the agriculture ministry has production as its um, target and then say the trade ministry has price stability as a target. So the trade ministry wants to make prices stable. They have to import to make sure that there's enough stock. And then the agri agriculture ministry will protest. They're saying, if you import, it's showing that my production is not enough. Yeah? And this is a classic uh, debate that we have between agriculture and, and trade. Right. But whereas if, if the, 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 the plan is, OK, price stability is number one, because otherwise people will become, uh, you, you're affecting poverty if the prices go up then, uh, okay, as long as there is a shortage, you, you, you have to import. And production, your production target does not get affected. You're not being penalized, you know, mm -hmm. something like that. So I, I would hope that uh, one, there's an, what, what, what are the five or six uh, major targets you want to achieve? Is it growth, exports, whatever? What is the contribution of each sector in a, a complementary way rather than in an uh, inconsistent way? And, and then measurement, quantitative, to the extent you can measure quantitative yeah. or qualitatively. So then you, you don't have a big debate about, you know, it's your fault, it's your fault, you know, <laughs> or it's my credit or <laughs> not your credit, you know, because uh, that's exactly what we try to do within each ministry when we were doing the bureaucratic reform. If you cannot measure their performance, it's really difficult. Yeah. Yes, I have a question over there. Um, hi, my name is Hans. I'm actually an uh, alumni of SMU, and um, I'm currently working at BKPM Singapore. So actually, I'm working <laughs> at the Investment Coordinating Board of Indonesia. And uh, I understand that Ibu Mari actually explained that uh, the key to, to the new, to, to, to growth in the new world, in the new balance, is actually right policy. And um, being working in the, at the BKPM Investment Coordinating Board, equi EDB equivalent of Indonesia, I, I happen to see myself how the uh, how Jokowi actually plans to you know uh, for example to simplify uh, licensing in Indonesia, which is actually to put all the different ministries together inside the investor coordinating board to to make sure that all investors have need to only go to one place to get all uh, answers in the matters of in investment licensing, um, but. In, but I think because Ibu Mari has become a, has experience of becoming of actually becoming a minister, both in trade and um, to tourism, do you think is, there is any other way to simplify this licensing faster, or do you think the current way is already good? <laughs> okay, uh, you're talking about it's never about, good enough. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's never good enough, you're right, and we tend to reinvent the wheel, okay? Yeah. Uh, but it's okay. Uh, we have to continue to, to push. The idea is you want to have one-stop uh, one -stop shop. And one-stop shop has to be a really one-stop shop, not like 10 or 20 uh, stops behind. Yeah? That, that's kind of the basic idea. And uh, under the new inv the investment law, which I was uh, partly responsible for in 2007, we already put in there uh, one stop integrated, one integrated stop at the national as well as at the regional level. And it took, I think it took three years just to come up with the implementing regulations. Mm -hmm. Because there was, you know, oh, no, 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 this cannot be, we cannot give the authority to Board of Investment to issue the, the permission for customs, for whatever, whatever. So a long debate, right? Three years. And then when it finally passed, then you still had to go 
you go to BKPM, yes, but then somebody in BKPM has to go to, <laughs> to the tra finance ministry or to the trade ministry. So it wasn't really one stop. That's why now you are getting the customs people to come and sit uh, in the big in board of investment. Okay, so uh, this is re uh, reinventing the wheel a little bit because a board of investment in the 90s was exactly like that. <laughs> Uh, but it was a different world because uh, it was top down then. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, uh, I think that, uh, what is it, 40, 40 ministries that you want to be in there. There are already 16 who have agreed to put their people there. You haven't talked about the regions, what happens uh, at the regions. That's another thing. Because one stop in Jakarta, then you go to try to open up your factory in somewhere else, and then you run into another uh, sets of issues. So that, that's another one that, that needs to be linked. Yes, I have several questions there, but I'm going to start with you, yeah. yeah. Oh, oh, I'm Gama from SME, I'm an Indonesian student also. And I'm just, uh, I'm very interested in creative economy, so I just want to ask, like, how much has creative economy actually contributed to uh, Indonesian growth, and what are the key challenges facing the government uh, uh, now? Yeah. Well, I thought about, you know, when I was coming in the door, I said, I, I think I should have uh, done the presentation on Indonesian creative economy today rather than <laughs> <laughs> all this beyond the new normal. Because it is something which is very exciting. Uh, one of the things, I was given this assignment three years ago, but I actually started looking at the creative economy maybe around 2007 in Indonesia. And one of the first things that we did uh, was, okay, we, talked, we, we looked at creative economy and we found that countries like the UK, like Korea, uh, had really uh, developed it in a very consistent way. Uh, and we, you know, so we described it, we tried to describe the importance of it, uh, and then uh, we faced uh, a kind of a blank wall because uh, my, well, I remember one of the first few meetings we had on the creative economy. Uh, the, the most fundamental question was, so how important is creative economy? Quantify it. <laughs> So, and that's exactly what we did. We did go and try to quantify it with uh, primary data, uh, not with primary data, with secondary data. And we can come up with a number that the creative economy contributes 7% to the Indonesian economy, 11% uh, of employment creation, and 10% of exports. So creative economy is defined in Indonesia a little bit like what the UK did in the beginning. It's 15 sectors. It's culinary, film, music, uh, all the IT-based industries, architecture, fashion, design, publication, printing, advertising, uh, even R&D uh, mm -hmm. is in there. Okay, so we defined it and then we, we did a lot of uh, work with the communities and trying to understand the industry. And by the end of my term, uh, October 2014, I completed my job by uh, making a blueprint uh, identifying the seven issues and hopefully the seven issues and we also had an action plan to address the seven issues uh, and the seven issues that are uh, facing uh, creative industries uh, the first one is human resources so skill talent uh, and education plays an important role formal and informal uh, second is access to inputs uh, and uh, resources and this can be uh, you know your the material you need as well as cultural resources mm -hmm. You know, your, your, your uh, ability to know, okay, different kinds of batik pattern, different kinds of um, materials that can be used, uh, different bamboo that can be used for different purposes. So archiving is very important, having database and archiving. Uh, number three is access to technology uh, and infrastructure. So having the ICT network is, um, is very, very key. Uh, number four is access to finance. And access to finance for creative industries is somewhat different from the usual problem faced by SMEs. Because they, uh, if they're not tangible, how do you value their, how do you uh, value IP? Yes. How do you value a design, you know? And, and be able to predict the cash flow. And then access to markets, yeah? And, and in creative industries, once again, it's not about, okay, I, I make sure that the retail sector is gonna take your goods or you have to go to the trade exhibition. It turns out that, you know, depending on the product, for instance, like games, online games, which Indonesia is, is also going global already, you, you, if for you to be able to make it in the, in the gaming, online gaming industry, you have to be on this website. Uh, your product has to be on this website. I think it's called Stream. 
uh, that's when you know you've made it. You know, it's like a little bit like the World Expo. You've got to be in the World Expo. This is like the World Expo for, for games. So it's a, it's a discovery that, that you have to make. And the last one is a conducive in, uh, and environment for, yeah. for yeah. creativity. It's the IPR protection. It's the creation of hubs. It's making sure you have theaters and uh, museums and so on. So that's kind of the seven challenges, and for each one of them, it's, it's slightly different. But it is actually quite a big part of the yes. Indonesian economy. Yes, yes. Yeah. I was somewhat surprised to hear the numbers there. Um, any other question? Uh, I'm, I'm going to go first that side, and then I come back there. Yeah. Hi, Bumari. My name is Bill. I'm a student in SMU, Indonesian student. And thank you for your speech. I was, I was uh, very interested in the sea highway, Tol Laut. And uh, my question is this. Um, given that the purpose of the whole sea highway is to flatten the price difference between the west and the east, right? And um, do you think it will pay off, given that the economy in the east is currently primarily in the primary sector, like commodities and um, agribusiness, right? And then secondly, um, given that the economy in Indonesia is very much skewed to the West, then logistically speaking, logistics, yeah, wise, then wouldn't a container ship that, trans that um, sets off in the, in the West to the East be filled and then on the return ship it will be empty, like nothing much to transport back, then wouldn't it increase the overall logistics cost in the country? And then lastly, what is the government's plan in, in, uh, in incentivize investment into the East, isn't part of, it, of the country? Thank you. Good question, but probably will take me a couple of hours to answer that. You, you don't get that. <laughs> <laughs> but I think this is an ongoing question that we have just because of the distance and the cost. I think we have to try to find creative solutions. And, and be able to identify hubs. Uh, and the problem is always, China has a similar problem. Everybody wants to be the hub. Every district wants to be the hub. Every province wants to have the hub. We want the international port here. We want the international airport here. Uh, but you can't do that. You really need to do the, the economics of it mm -hmm. and figure out, okay, the hub is here. This is the, the major port. And then what's the feeder? What's the, and then design the feeder. Uh, feeder ports and uh, it can be the smaller boats or the ferries or whatever and then the roads right mm -hmm. uh, and this is what I think has been lacking uh, because of coordination even within one, one ministry you have like the transportation ministry they're in charge of sea transportation air transportation road transportation and railway transportation but if they don't coordinate you end up with airports that have no roads going there. <laughs> and <I've seen laughs> unfortunately, of, we do I've have seen examples. Some of those. And the examples are very recent, you know. So I think it, it really requires uh, a firm uh, understanding of, of the economic flow yeah, of the goods. Uh, and if you really want, and, and then you have to have the, the, the supply being very clear. Well, your second question was what are the incentives? Uh, in, in the car, you know, since uh, uh, several years ago, we already have an incentive uh, that is built in the Board of Investment, Investment Allowance incentive, which says that uh, you can get, is it 30% or 40%? 30%, you can write off 30% of your investment uh, if you are uh, in certain sectors or certain regions. So Eastern Indonesia is always uh, given this, uh, this possibility and maybe tax incentive. But I think at the end of the day, uh, it is about infrastructure, more about infrastructure and capacity building and human resources. So it's not that just the hard infrastructure, but you've got to really focus also on the soft infrastructure. I'll take a second question from that side. It's random, but... And then I come back to you. How about the middle? The middle. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Kenny. I'm an Indonesian student here. I'm also the head of um, SMU Communitas Indonesia. Um, I have a question regarding um, infrastructure as well. So one of the one of the things that um, the government justify on raising uh, on reducing the 
um, fuel subsidy, um, subsidy BBM is for infrastructures, right? But how much of a difference does it actually make, given um, all the all the you know the, the chaos and the protests that we always have? And um, the second question is um, more on um, the domestic political um, things as well, like with the recent um, KPK and and um, the police problems. Uh, how much of a difference will it make? Um, to our economic outlook this year, because um, um, the investors' confidence might change a lot from what I can gather. Thank you. Okay, uh, on infrastructure, uh, the amount of uh, uh, budget released because you are not subsidizing fuel is very significant. Uh, it's like 15, 16 billion dollars a year. And uh, a large part of that will be uh, used for uh, building infrastructure. So if you look at the, at, the, at the current budget that's trying to be re, uh, passed in parliament, I think it's 20%, um, I said 20% that's going to go for infrastructure. Compared to average, it's, I think it's higher, I think it's like 23%. On, compared to average the last 10 years, uh, last five years of 14% that was going uh, for infrastructure. So hopefully it means you know, there's more money for infrastructure. But that's only from the government. As I said, only 25% is going to be able to be funded for government. So the other important component, the 75% that's going to have to come from private sector, must mean two things because it's, you know, our problem in, in the last five, 10 years, because I was in government, has always been about uh, getting access to land. Okay, so you've got to solve that. And the law is already there, the so-called um, eminent domain law where the government can take land for public use is already there, but we haven't implemented it. Uh, second is the you know, transparent process, economic pricing, uh, so that you have the public-private partnership uh, really, really happen. Uh, and I think the quick win for infrastructure is solve and de-bottleneck the issues that you already have for the projects that are in the pipeline already, because the new ones are gonna take time for you to, to get into place. And that would be the quick win. Uh, on the KPK and uh, police uh, disputes, uh, well, that's, that's you, as you know, uh, that's part that's of Indonesian nice. uh, <laughs> politics, and that, that's what makes Indonesia interesting. Uh, I, I think, uh, it, I, don't, I don't think it will have a huge effect on investor co investment climate, uh, as long as on the other policies, uh, we will continue to be on the right track, and uh, there is no kind of intervention, you know, say you don't close down KPK, for instance, yeah? Uh, no, it's nothing drastic like that, but you go through the process uh, in, in the way it should be. I'll take one question there, and then I will come back to the middle. Uh, yeah, Prof. Murray, uh, my name is Joshua. I'm a year two student from SMU, and I'm an Indonesian also. Uh, yeah. <laughs> We're very active today. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Basically, uh, uh, this February, Indonesian stock exchange recorded an all-time high, and also uh, BPS released a very good uh, statistic for Indonesia macroeconomic outlook with positive trade balance surplus. But here again, uh, uh, political instability seems to be more apparent nowadays with the newly elected radical Greek party, and also. Yeah, just mentioned earlier the conflict between KPK and Polri. So, what's your view on uh, financial markets and economic outlook in Indonesia? I believe the financial uh, market in Indonesia is closely related to macroeconomic and political situation. Yeah, thank you. Well, I think if you look at the financial market, as you said, the stock market is doing well, and the rupiah is is still not strengthening but i don't think we expect that just because exports despite the good number in december for uh, trade uh, it's still a, a low surplus yeah and i don't expect export to to be growing very much this year because of external demand and soft prices uh, but investment um, numbers are look good last year and it, it still continues to look good because i think i think investors look medium term, they don't look, I mean, foreign direct investment. Financial investors uh, are a, a little different, of course, but the foreign direct investment is, is uh, coming in and being very interested uh, to come into Indonesia. Uh, and uh, I think you have to distinguish between the noise. Um, if you live in Indonesia, you, 
you feel like you know this is so gloomy, so dark. But actually, when you step back and look at it, you know all the noise that's happening is it's not protesting about policy. It's protesting about appointments of people and personal personalities. Uh, it's not protesting about the policy. You know, I mean, the the fuel price increase went quite smoothly, uh, and then there was the compensation scheme. So. Uh, it's not a fundamental uh, problem that we are dealing with. It's just, you know, a lot of noise. It looks like noisy. It's, it's democracy. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's noisy. It's normal. <laughs> okay, I'll take one last question. I I know there are many hands, but I'll I'll have to uh, to randomly take one. Please. Yeah. Uh, thank you. I'm Henry Pranoto from Lion Global Investors. Um, you know, I'm understanding that um, I'm understanding that Indonesia also, in in some pieces, there is an oligopoly there. And then I um, understand that maybe the new government is not patient enough to control the price. Maybe after Pak Jokowi reducing the fuel price, and then the inflation is still quite high. And then they end up by intervening the market to the SOE. Uh, especially the cement price. As an ex-trade um, minister, uh, what do you think that for the new policy of the government by using the SOE to intervene in the market? Thank you. Huh. <laughs> uh, I think Another question that probably could take three hours. Right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, you know, we, we always, it's, it's a, again always a cycle, you know, we always think that we can uh, stabilize prices uh, and, and make prices lower uh, for uh, development reasons. And you can do that if you have money in your budget to, to offset for the SOE or whoever is going to be the one that has to uh, subsidize the price or, or keep stocks uh, to make sure that they can intervene. And uh, they will experiment, and they will find that uh, it, it, there's a cost to it. Yeah? And, any distort and sometimes when you have a distortion like that, uh, say you are trying to keep the prices lower than what the market should be, you'll end up having smuggling. Well, for cement, it's a bit difficult to smuggle. But for anything like sugar or rice or whatever, it's very easy to smuggle. The moment the price difference between your price and, and outside is I have this rule of thumb when I was a trade minister. It's 25% uh, for rice. And it's in general around that number for other commodities. As long as there's that price difference, if you're lower, then people are going to take your, your uh, goods out cross-border, like that happened with fuel. Uh, if it's the other way, way around, if your price is higher than the world, then people are going to smuggle in. And what happens is actually then the prices come down. But it wasn't because you, you did all this policy, but because there was all this uh, smuggling. So I think, I think intervention can be done as long as it's done in a very targeted and, and, and clever way. And it will cost. Okay? There is always a cost. And that's why you don't want to do it for all commodities. You have to choose uh, which commodity you want to do it for. And then you still have to subject it to transparency and, and performance base. Like when I was trade minister, we did manage the import of sugar. but. But whether they get another uh, license to import sugar the following year depends on whether they did a good job importing sugar in the, in the previous year. Um, I'm sorry, but I will have to, uh, um, this comes to an end, and I know that there are still a lot of questions. Uh, as I said, uh, when we started with the questions, this was a master class in applied macroeconomics applied to Indonesia. Uh, trying to summarize that would be impossible for me, but. I wrote down sort of five points uh, that I think are important to Indonesia. That is, first of all, uh, that sort of positive plea for trade, trade as a driver uh, for growth, uh, is something that I think was throughout your whole intervention uh, important. And uh, that, that plea for trade, uh, there, are always, the, the lo there will always be some losers and some winners, but overall we are, we are going to win out of that. The second one is, of course, the, um, the need for Indonesia to diversify its exports and actually to increase the value added in the global uh, value chain. The, thir the third point that came back several times and I think is important is this whole issue about investment in infrastructure, uh, trying to reduce the cost of logistics, 
uh, notwithstanding the difficulties of having a country with, uh, you mentioned 17,000 islands. I always thought it was 13,000, but I... Uh, Depends high tide or low tide. Ah, yes, I see. <laughs> um, but I've probably in the process lost a few somewhere, right? Um, the, the fourth point I thought was important is that there is a need for administrative reform, but one should be realistic about it. That is, uh, go for the low-hanging fruit, go for the... Uh, uh, symbolic, uh, or the, the signaling is more than symbolic, the signaling actions that can help you. Uh, and the fifth one is that uh, I heard this passionate uh, discussion about the creative industries. I must say that I was quite surprised about uh, the importance of these creative industries for Indonesia, uh, but uh, we haven't even touched on tourism. Uh, uh, as you were the one who said that we wanted to learn the world that uh, Indonesia was not a a city somewhere in Bali. Yes. Yeah, right, uh, um, so we could actually have spent a lot of time on tourism too. But I think that uh, I express uh, the feeling of the people in the room here by saying that this was a very interesting discussion. And uh, when we listen to all of this, there's probably a lot of noise. But the long term picture for Indonesia seems to be a very fine one. Thank you very much for your contribution. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we have a little... Uh, we are this year 15 years and we have uh, stamps, <laughs> commemorative stamps uh, and a few other elements uh, that uh, are okay, uh, produced nice. for our uh, 15th anniversary. This so. is a creative product, creative yes. industry product. <laughs> and this is a very old fashioned product, right? <laughs> stamps for envelopes. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you.